It is an amazing God that we serve, right? One who protected us this week, and we're thankful for that. Do keep those in the Big Island and uh, up on Lahaina side in your prayers as they recover some of these challenges uh, that uh, we were um, uh, we avoided by God's grace. Um, if you don't mind, give me one moment to kind of share with you a couple of things coming up just because there's no really ever good place to do this in a service, so I'm going to do it here if you don't mind. Uh, you might call these the announcements or um, if we were watching television, you know, those dreaded advertisements. So give me just a quick second. A um, couple of things that are important to coming up to tonight. Uh, we'd like to invite the church Ohana, uh, of course, to a family dinner here, and then we're going to be having an important meeting as we uh, look to the future and address some questions that face us regarding adding staff and uh, some other things. So I hope that you'll be able to be here tonight. Um, make uh, every point if you can to be here and join us tonight at, uh, at 5 p.m. A couple of exciting things coming up soon, and that is uh, we're going to be hosting family night, uh, Wednesday nights, starting on September 5th. And that will include a study for uh, uh, parents and, and families with children called Growing Kids God's Way. Some of you maybe have seen that or been through that or have friends who've been through. It's a tremendous, a terrific program. And really encourage you, if you have friends or family with young children or raising children, to come through that, uh, come to that course. Uh, it'd be, uh, you'll learn a lot, and it will be a very uh, valuable time. Uh, also, during that time, we'll have stuff going for the kids. The Kids Quest will resume uh, on the 5th. Uh, and that's for ages 5 through 5th grade. And there is a volunteer meeting, I'm supposed to tell you, uh, coming this Wednesday at 6 p.m. So I think that covers it. The information's in your worship folder. You can look for more information there if you need. Now, good morning. We're glad you're here. You didn't have to swim or take your kayak to church. A couple of years ago, for those of you who don't know, we actually had a picture of people kayaking in front of the church sign. A few years back, with heavy rains, there were people paddling a couch down South Kihei Road. <laughs> so we are very fortunate, are we not? We're in the book of Acts, as we've been studying together through this terrific book, and I'm excited to bring to you a message that God's laid on my heart from Acts chapter 18. Before we begin, let me share a few things with you. Today we're going to look at Paul's pattern for disciple-making. And you understand, as I am sure you do, uh, that that is the purpose of the church. If you're going to summarize it and boil it down, there are many things that churches exist for. But, but frankly, the church exists to make disciples. That was our mission given to us by God. And in every city, Paul practiced certain things. He had a pattern. And, and we're going to look at that a little bit today. In every city, Paul preached the gospel. He baptized those who responded to it in faith. Then he persisted quite often in the face of very stringent and, and difficult opposition. And he taught the, those who believed the Bible. Now, this is a pattern that we can follow right here on Maui as we uh, minister to the people of Maui and beyond. I want to share with you a little story. Uh, have you heard the name George Mueller? Maybe some of you. George Mueller was a Christian evangelist, and he was the director of Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. During his lifetime, he cared for more than 10,000 orphans, including providing for their education. Mueller was directly responsible in the establishment of 117 Christian schools which educated more than 120,000 children. He was famous for his intense faith in the Lord's provision. It's widely known that Mueller never made requests for financial support, nor did he ever go in debt in these ministries. He relied on God to provide uh, for the ministry and many times... Uh, received unsolicited food and, and various uh, resources and money just the moment before they were needed either to feed the children or pay the bills. He was known as a man of powerful prayer. Of the many things he prayed for was the salvation of five friends he wanted to see come to know Christ. He decided one time to pray for these men, and after many months, one of them came to know the Lord. Ten years later, 
two others were converted to Christ. It took 25 years for the fourth man to come to faith in Christ, yet he continued to pray for the fifth man for 52 years, never giving up hope that he would come to Jesus. And his prayers were rewarded. His prayers were answered. This man came to know the Lord soon after George Mueller's funeral. That's persistence. That's perseverance, isn't it? That's not quitting and not letting go. And friends, when we share the gospel, when we serve the Lord, when we're praying for those who are lost, when we're caring for those in need, when is it too soon to quit? You know the answer, don't you? It's always too soon to quit. Now, we're going to look today at the Apostle Paul as he's writing, uh, as, as we, he writes uh, in, in 1 Corinthians to this church that we're going to look at today. He says this, My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He writes that to this church at Corinth that we're going to look at this morning. And as you know from the two letters that Paul wrote later, this was a troublesome church. They sort of were giving fits, right? And yet he never gave up on them. It's to this church in the Achaean capital of Corinth that we find ourselves studying today uh, as we look at Paul's second missionary journey. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, uh, turn with me there to Acts, uh, Acts chapter 18. Uh, if not, join your neighbor in, and share that, that Bible. Um, I've decided I'm not going to put the, the, the text on the screen anymore. I know it's helpful for those who need big, big huge numbers, like, but we have large print Bibles right there in the row in front of you. I want you to hold a Bible in your hand and look at it. So if you have to find it, Acts chapter 18. Somebody want to give me the page number? 1679. There, see, I saved all y'all of who don't know where the books are. I don't want to know what is in your personal Bible. What's it in the one that we got there? What? 1179. Well, we've got two versions there. You may, who knows? Maybe it won't be that price. You'll find it. There's a concordance in the front. You can look it up. All right? Now, here we're going to look at Paul, and we'll see what Dr. Luke uh, describes for us here in Acts chapter 18. As you're turning there, I'm going to share, you, uh, share with you a little bit of important information about this ancient metropolis that, that occupied so much of Paul's time. Uh, and, and also, he writes, of course, two letters to them. Um, ancient Corinth dates back to 800 years before Christ. It was destroyed about 150 years before Christ, and then it was rebuilt uh, by Julius Caesar 50 years or 46 years before Christ. That means that the city that Paul visits in the time of his visits, about 50 uh, A.D. Do you know what A.D. is? Do they use that anymore? Anno Domini, Latin for the year of our Lord. Now, I know they don't want to admit these days that the world changed when Jesus came to earth. And so, historically, it's been what? Before Christ and the year of our Lord. Now it's B.C.E., before the Common Era, and C.E., if we ever get a Christian school started here, we're going to scrap that stuff. Is that all right? Teach them what it really is. Anyway, at that time, when Paul visits, the, the, the city is only about 100 years old, and it is a huge, booming Grecian city with a population of 200,000 free citizens. That's Greeks and Romans, uh, Italians, uh, Roman army veterans. But it was also home to nearly 500,000 slaves making this a town of nearly three-quarters of a million people. Corinth is located on the southern end of the isthmus that connects the Peloponnesus with the mainland of Greece. You were pretty impressed that I could say that, Peloponnesus, right? I've been there. It's a major commercial center. Uh, do we have the picture up there? There you go, right there. It's a major commercial center at this time because it's connecting the Adriatic Sea on the west and Centuria on the east. There was a canal that Nero began, thinking we'll just cut a cost there, and then you can connect by this canal, but he never finished it. That wasn't finished until the 19th century. 
But there was a slipway, a road that was used kind of like a, a train to move goods and even small boats across that isthmus, saving them a couple hundred miles of treacherous seas uh, back in those days. It made Corinth a very major commercial center. The town would have been filled with mariners as well as merchants. And as you might imagine, this made this a city full of mischief and immorality. Now, the ancient Greeks used to use a word that says to Corinthianize, which really refers to sexual immorality. And that word is still used in, Greece, in Greek today, to Corinthianize, a condition that was everywhere during Paul's time there. The city, for example, worshipped at the temple of Aphrodite. You heard of Aphrodite? This was the goddess of love in which the temple sat on a hill about 2,000 feet above the city, and, and that's where a 1,000 temple prostitutes served in that temple and plied their trade throughout Corinth. There was also a, a temple to the sun god Apollo and the Greek god uh, Asclepius and the god Poseidon. You heard of Poseidon before? God of the sea, and the Romans called Neptune. We also know there was a large number of Jews there because there was a synagogue, and as was his routine, Paul first goes to the synagogue. He traveled, we know, from to Corinth from Athens, where we just studied, where he shared this great uh, um, argument about the, the faith of uh, the Christian faith uh, to the philosophers there in Athens. But he travels alone to Corinth. And Luke records for us his efforts. First of all, to the intellectual, philosophical center there in Athens, and then to the commercial center in Corinth, and as we'll see next time, uh, to the religious center of Ephesus. Now, what's Luke's goal here? Luke's goal that we read in Acts is not to provide us with a full detail of everything Paul did day in and day out. He was there more than a year and a half, and yet we only have a few verses here to talk about. But Luke's point is an important one, as we're going to see here. Now, let's pick up the story. Are you, did you all find it? Good. I see a lot of heads nodding. Acts 18, let's read it together in, in verse 1. And thank you, Dave, for reading that. We're going to be doing that regularly, reading from God's Word uh, each, each service. Let's just take a look at the beginning here. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of pa uh, Pontus recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, just a moment here. It starts with the words, after this, after Paul's speech at the Areopagus. That was the philosophical center of the world in those days. This is where Socrates and Plato spoke and taught, and Paul standing there, arguing a very different philosophy, a worldview that comes from the Bible, a worldview that begins with God as the, the creator of all things and the source of all truth. That's the after this. And, of course, you remember the aftermath of that and what happened there in Athens. So he sets forth to go to Corinth alone, and it tells us in 1 Corinthians, now we're looking a little bit at another passage, you don't have to turn there, but of course Paul writes later to the Corinthian church, he says of, of that time when he's coming there, he determined in advance no, to know nothing while he was there but Jesus Christ and him crucified. What's that mean? He was coming to Corinth with a singular purpose, a singular focus of sharing who Jesus Christ is and what he did on the cross. And he also said he's arrived in Corinth in weakness, in fear, with much trembling. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? You do recall that Paul was warned by Jesus, was told in advance all of the things that he would suffer as he shared the gospel from city to city. And he did, didn't he? Beaten, you know, imprisoned, left for dead on the city trash heap. But I don't think that's the reason for Paul's fear when he comes to Corinth. I think it has to do with the city's great wickedness and perhaps its commercial prestige, both of which are direct obstacles to the gospel. Think about it. This intense immorality that, that the city was known for meant that the, the people of the city were not used to living in any kind of self-denial. 
and its great commercial wealth meant that the other people in the city were used to taking care of themselves. They were self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency and a lack of self-denial are obstacles to hearing the gospel, which demands both, doesn't it? And so I think Paul, with intent to carry the gospel, was concerned about these things. Now we see here in verse 2, he meets up with some people, Aquila and Priscilla, and they're going to come up throughout the New Testament. Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila is the husband, Priscilla is the wife. These become Paul's teammates. They're, they're fellow helpers to the gospel. They were believers, as far as we can understand, already when they were in Rome because we're told here that they have to leave Rome. Right? They arrived in Corinth being forced out of Rome by an edict of the emperor. Now, at that time, the emperor was Claudius. That would have been the Roman emperor. And we know from a, for a fact from writings of a uh, Roman historian, um, Suetonius, he wrote a book, a, a, a history called of the life of Claudius. And in it, listen to this, he wrote that Claudius expelled all the Jews because of a turmoil or commotion instigated by Christus. In that Latin, it was spelled C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. And there's some confusion, but the name was most likely pronounced in that time, Christus, which is what? The Latin name for Christ. So it was evidence that Christianity had already reached Rome, and the non-believing Jews were being stirred up by those who were bringing Christ into uh, the synagogues, just like Paul was. Why? Because Jesus friends, in case you've forgotten, was a Jew, right? Jesus was the promised Messiah of the Jews, and that's what Paul came to share. That's what was being shared in Rome. And, of course, the arguments that you see the, the, the Jewish religious leaders bring against Paul, those same kind of things were happening in Rome. So it evidences that the gospel was already there, and Priscilla and Aquila left Rome as believers and brought their faith with them to Corinth. Now, verse 2 says, and he went to see them. Now, whether Paul met them in the synagogue and became aware of them or whether he knew them of them in advance or met them in the, in the quarter where the tent makers worked, we don't know. But he connected with Aquila and Priscilla. And verse 3 tells us they, they worked in the same trade, and so he stayed and worked with them. Now, this is the first time that, that this couple is mentioned, but they become an essential part of Paul's missionary journeys. You know, let me take a moment here. When you're working uh, for the gospel, when you're intently uh, engaged in ministry with the idea of reaching men and women and boys and girls with the gospel and seeing them enter and begin a new life with him, that can be a very lonely ministry. And sometimes it is terrific to know that you're not alone, that God brings people together for the advancement of the gospel. And Aquila and Priscilla worked, worked with Paul. Perhaps they employed him, by the way. It, it seems as if they had a, an, an, a, a rather uh, large business in many different cities because uh, they show up at several different cities. Romans tells us that they risked their lives for Paul, and they assisted him in Ephesus and even hosted a church in their home. This mission we're on to take the gospel to the world uh, and make disciples of all who believe, friends, is a team effort. You understand? Now, what's happened these days is something called consumer Christianity, where the idea has somehow penetrated our brains that the goal is to come to church on Sunday and see those who are professional ministers uh, minister for us as we consume something from them. I don't know how that slipped into our churches, but, friends, that's not what the Bible describes. We're part of a body, all of us, each uniquely gifted to be involved and engaged in this ministry of taking the good news to the lost. Sometimes it's valuable to just have a few like-minded believers working beside you, and that may be all it takes to weather the difficulties and storms of ministry. We know from this passage that they were tent makers by trade. Paul, you remember, was a Jewish rabbi. 
was trained by rabbis. And rabbis required all of the young Jewish men that they were training to develop some skill uh, in industry, something that they could do with their hands. They did not accept money uh, from those who, for whom they taught, unlike the Greek philosophers. Now, we know from Scripture that, that Paul, uh, in and, and this particular case, emphasizes his self-support, his ability to support himself in order to show that he was not trying to derive anything from the gospel, that he was not developing any prosperity from the gospel. But on other occasions, Paul uh, wrote that it was proper for those who labor in the truth to be supported by those whom he serves. You can look at 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Timothy 5. But here, he didn't want the impression that his livelihood was dependent uh, on the gospel or that there was a price tag to it, okay? There's much to be said for what we call tent-making ministry these days. And many churches are doing that. And there may be a day we need to consider that here. Where those who are serving in the church are also doing some ministry, some work out in the, in the, in the, in the world uh, and helping to support themselves. It minimizes the financial burden to the church. But also these days, a lot of people are moving into tent-making ministries so that they can get into places where the gospel cannot go. There are many parts of our world where if, if, it were, if you were aware that this person was a Christian, you would not be allowed to come. But if you have certain skills, technological skills or whatever, they are happy uh, to have you there. And many missionaries uh, are entering into, um, let's say, for example, Muslim areas uh, that are controlled by, by Islam uh, because they are able to bring skills as, as a doctor or as an uh, IT professional or something like that. Okay? Now, let's take a look at Paul's pattern for discipleship as we read in verse 4 and following. It says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Greeks, Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. That's an interesting passage, one that we've seen similar in other passages here in Acts. It's Paul, we know from this text, spent his days working as a tent maker. Perhaps that was the trade that he picked up as he was being trained as a rabbi, or it may go back to his origins uh, where he was from, where the industry, the textile industry was strong, and they would make uh, materials and tents out of those materials. It's very likely this meant that he was a leather worker because most of the tents were made out of leather at that time. He spent his days working in tent making, But he spent his Sabbaths in the synagogue trying to win Jews to Christ. Now, I want you to think about that, friends. Does that mean that that Paul didn't share his faith every day wherever he was? Do you really think that's likely? I mean, for what impression I have of Paul in the Scriptures, I think that would be really hard for him to do, wouldn't you? I think wherever he was, whoever he was talking to next was a person he would share the good news with. And my, my friends, if we cannot live our faith in the workplace, it really has no place for us here in the worship center. Right? It's either real or it isn't. And I think we see here a part of a pattern of Paul's disciple-making process. He preached the gospel. I want you to understand a couple of words here. You're coming here to hear me preach, and let me tell you, friends, it's the wrong word. And I know you all go, you're a lousy preacher anyway, but the point is when Paul was preaching, he wasn't talking to a bunch of people who thought of themselves as Christians. You understand? For him, preaching was taking the gospel to the lost. We think, oh, let's come and hear the preacher. I grew up in the South. That's what you called the guy who does what I'm doing up here, the preacher, right? Just preacher. Or the brother this. They did a lot of brother things down there. I never got all that. But preacher, right? But friends, the idea is he shared the gospel 
specifically with the intent of making sure people heard about the good news of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did, how God brings a, a, a new relationship with himself through him, and he preached that to the lost. He spoke the word about Jesus, telling his story to biblically, here, biblically knowledgeable Jews. He was trying to help them see the connection that the Messiah they were waiting for was, in fact, Jesus the Christ. He was the one that was crucified and rose from the dead in Jerusalem. And he was trying to help them see from their own scriptures that he was the Savior of the world. Now, I want you to notice three words here that we need to take into consideration as we're trying to share the gospel. First of all, the word reasoning. Second, persuading. And third, testifying. I think we could learn a lot from Paul's process here as we consider our own witnessing techniques. Reasoning first. Paul took the Jews through their own Old Testament scriptures, looking closely at the prophecies of the Messiah and their literal fulfillment in the life and earthly ministry of Jesus. Did you know there were over 300 specific prophecies, many going back hundreds if not even thousands of years before Christ, that were literally fulfilled in Christ's coming to earth, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. That's a lot. And if you take somebody through that, and you can show them that these things, as the Jews knew, were written centuries before Christ, and they could see and identify their literal fulfillment, then what does it make them if they decide that they don't want to believe it? The word stupid comes to mind, but you can come up with something else. Now, today, most people are biblically illiterate, aren't they? You talk to somebody about the Bible, and they go, well, I think there's one on the shelf. Mom's got one somewhere at the old house, right? They don't know Scripture, but these people did know the Scripture. They were people of the book. But even today... The Holy Spirit can use the Word of God, and it can, He can use real, logical, historically verified details about the Old Testament prophecy and its New Testament fulfillment in Jesus to convince even people today of the truth claims of Jesus. And you can be confident of that. Consider the many books that have been written in, the, in years past. I remember one beginning with um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Perhaps some of you read that. Recently, uh, The Case for Christ was a, a big book that a lot of people have read, written by a lawyer who is looking at it in this exact way, reasoning. Since the gospel is completely true, it is not unreasonable that taking someone through the story logically might help them find Christ, correct? So Paul reasoned. Secondly, he persuaded. And sometimes we've got to go a little past reasoning. The gospel isn't just logic. It's the most emotionally powerful thing anybody will ever believe, right? That there is a God that created us and that our sin stands between him and us and that without Christ on the cross, we are hopelessly lost to condemn is a really big deal. But that there is grace and there is forgiveness and there's a restored relationship possible through the cross is a big deal. And so he needed to persuade them, not just reason with them, he spoke passionately, knowing that there was a judgment hanging over the heads of every man and woman and boy and girl. Did you join us as we went through the book of Romans? What do the first three chapters tell us? To the Jewish person who said, yeah, but we have the law, he said, and you haven't kept it and you're guilty before God. To the morally upright person who doesn't have the law but says, I'm a good person, you know anybody like that? Just about everybody you meet, right, uh, compares themselves with somebody next to them and says, I'm a good person. To them, they're still lost, Paul said. And to the, to the immoral pagan person who lives life any which way they want, eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow I die, they too are lost. All of us are lost. And there's a judgment hanging over our head. And Paul wanted to make sure they understood that. He reasoned with them, and his reason was accompanied by a passion. And friends, we need to share the gospel boldly and passionately. It is this same Paul 
that wrote to us, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto the salvation, right? Now, let's be honest. Can we do that on a Sunday morning in church? Are you embarrassed about the gospel? Are you willing to boldly share it passionately with your neighbors and coworkers and family and friends or not? If Christ stood before us this moment, would we be looking at our shoes saying, yeah, I'm sorry, I failed miserably. I was ashamed of the gospel. Wouldn't every one of you, wouldn't I like to say, I am not ashamed? Can you say that? Honestly? Friends, if we could, I know this, there would be a whole lot more gospel sharing going on in Maui. And sometimes, some people will reject that truth. And sometimes, some people will believe it. Some will. Some won't. So what? Some will. You going to share? Are you ashamed? Why would we ever be ashamed of the gospel? What we're really ashamed of is ourselves, right? And the way we live it. That's the facts. And so he persuaded them. But he also did more than that. He invited them. There's a challenge, an invitation. And he invited them to listen to his own story. Testifying, it says. Did you see that? Testifying. He said, I don't know how to share the gospel. No, but I'll tell you this. Every single one of us is capable of sharing a story about a personal experience that we've had. Where were you when 9-11 happened? Where were you with the great storm of yesterday happened? You can share that with no problem, even passionately. All of us can share our own personal story, and that's what testifying is. Paul's sharing his story, his story of being radically changed by the gospel, of being the persecutor of this very subject, this very truth the one who wanted to see all of the Christians thrown in jail and was even willing happily to stand there and let everybody throw their cloaks at his feet as they stoned Stephen. You remember? But look at what happened when one day he met Jesus and it changed his life forever. Now he could share that, and he did. He testified of them. And there's nothing perhaps any more powerful than any one of us can share than our own personal testimony of how the grace of God has impacted our lives. No one can argue with the truth that you know that you live, right? We better at least be sharing that. To do so, we might risk ridicule or rejection or even maybe some injury. But we must boldly share our story and his story, which is the sharing of the gospel with those who are lost and dying. Why, friends? Today is the day of salvation, and tomorrow's not guaranteed, right? Now, I want you to see in verse 5, it says he was occupied with the word. The narrative changes here when Paul's other teammates show up. Silas and Timothy not only brought Paul some important... Um, encouragement by their presence, but they also brought with them some financial support from the churches in Asia. And this allowed Paul to focus his time on his gospel ministry. He basically said, okay, I'm going to set aside tent making. I'm going to go full time today in sharing the gospel. So what is it he did, first of all, in this big process of making disciples? Number one, he, made, he shared the gospel. Number two, he baptized believers. Baptism is an essential part of disciple-making. And friends, I want to speak to you honestly and sternly uh, and hopefully kindly today. You all need to be baptized. You got it? Not for getting saved, but on account of you being saved. So that's the language I grew up with, okay? What is baptism? Baptism publicly acknowledges my existing faith in Christ. It says, I believe. I'm following him. I'm identified with him. 
And friends, if you're scared to say that, you aren't going to share the gospel with anybody, right? Secondly, baptism strengthens our commitment to Christ as our Lord. Why? Because he's the one that says, do it. And either you're going to obey or you aren't. Right? And if I'm not going to let him be Lord of my life, then what am I really in for here? I know the answer. Heaven when I die. And all I have to do is lip sync a few things that says, I think this is true about Jesus. That's not what he said. And thirdly, baptism identifies us with his body, the church, buried with him and resurrected to a new life. Do you understand? Y'all been baptized? Today, people look at baptism as something optional. But the early church took it as an immediate step of obedience. The New Testament doesn't know anything of an unbaptized believer. Friends, if you have never been baptized, there is no acceptable excuse. It's a matter of first importance if you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're unwilling to be baptized, you're essentially saying, I'd like a little of heaven when I die, but I don't want to die to myself now. I'd like to continue to run my life my way. Now, that's called preaching today, okay? Friends, that kind of faith is popular today, but I, I think it's greatly suspect. Jesus made dying to oneself a qualification for discipleship, and that's exactly what baptism illustrates, right? Now, number three, he persisted in the face of opposition. Did you see verse 6? When they opposed him and reviled him. And just like in so many other cities, the Jews, especially the Jewish religious leaders, they set their efforts to thwart the gospel and thwart what Paul was doing. You see, when the gospel is reaching people effectively, we can certainly expect our enemy to rise up and attempt to squash those results, wouldn't you think? And he does that oftentimes by discouraging those who are sharing the gospel. You think Paul might have been at this time getting a little tired of the same story over and over every time he went to another city? Go to the Jews, preach to them, share with them how much God loves them, share with them the story about Jesus only to be rejected by them or be beaten or driven out of town by them. Stirring up mobs against them. On this occasion, it tells us he did something a little special. Did you catch it? What did he do? It's a very Jewish thing that goes back to the Old Testament prophets. He shook out his garments. said, I'm walking out of town here. I, nothing of you is coming with me. All right? Paul switched his efforts to the Gentiles, and he did so in an elaborate gesture. And notice what he said in verse 6. Your blood be on your own heads. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Remember Jesus' similar statement? The Jews were people of the book. They had a historical knowledge of God, and they were not supposed to be ignorant of God's plan or his purposes. They were responsible to God in the Old Testament law, and they were responsible now for their own rejection of God's grace. And friends, that's going to be coming sometimes. You're going to share with somebody as clearly and passionately and sharing your testimony and wanting to help them understand how they might have a restored relationship with the God of creation, and they might look at you and just say, I don't want it. And you say, okay. It's not my job to force you. It is my job to make sure you know that it's available. And you might, like G George Mueller, continue to pray for them for 52 years because you never know what God's going to bring in their life to soften them up, Right? Paul didn't quit sharing with the Jews forever, as we see. In the next city, he goes right back to them. But here, for this time, he now focuses his attention to the Gentiles. And verse 7 tells us, Titius Justus, a God worshiper. That phrase, God worshiper, means he wasn't a Jew, but he was worshiping God in the Jewish synagogue. And he most likely heard the gospel there and became a believer along with the ruler of the synagogue. Who is that? Like the highest Jewish religious leader at the time in that city and along with many other Corinthians. Friends, when we take time to share the gospel, some will believe. Do you believe that? You want to know why? Because at the core of the heart of every man and woman and boy and girl is a clear sense that something isn't right. 
And the only thing that can ever make it right is a restored relationship with the God of creation, right? And you're showing sure them how. Now, let's note how Paul becomes a shining example of us when we, of what we should be when we face opposition. And what should we do when we face opposition? Fold up our tent and run, right? One of my all-time favorite movies, Monty Python, The Holy Grail. You all remember the? This is the good stuff you get at church, right? There's a section where King Arthur and his brave knights face a rabbit. <clears throat> and at the end of it, after the rabbits just defeated them every which way, they run away and scream, run away, and that becomes sort of a theme throughout the movie, right? Is that what we're supposed to do? Is that what we do? Too often. When God calls us to a ministry, he is fully capable of sustaining us through any storm that we might face. Do you believe that? We're going to face opposition. The gospel's not popular, friends, but we must not become dropouts in the school of Christ. You're right. This is a time for faith. And faith may not always give you what you want, but it will always give you what God wants. Nothing pleases God more than faith. When we're at our weakest, he can be at his strongest. And faith causes us to keep our eyes on Jesus and find that he is fully capable of meeting our needs and establishing and strengthening our faith. I will tell you, friends, I'm a little concerned. We are called to be in the game, and many want to be in the grandstands. Time to get off your butt and get going, okay? Okay. Sometimes we need the encouragement and presence of friends like, like Aquila and Priscilla and Silas and Timothy. But there is nothing better to sustain us and to sustain our resolve in continuing on with the ministry than a clear awareness of God's presence with us in that calling. Would you agree? Am I right, brother? I want you to see a prohibition here and a promise from Jesus. Verse 9. The Lord says to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For what? Speak it together, guys. What? I am with you. And no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Do you remember what Jesus said when he commissioned his apostles before he ascended into heaven? What did he say? All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. Right? Baptizing them in the name and the Father and the Son and the Spirit, teaching them how to observe and to do all of the things that I've commanded you. And what? And I will be with you always. Friends, as is in Paul's days, so much also in our days, nothing is of such value as knowing God is with us, right? When we get to the place where we know God is with us and we know that then nothing is going to be accomplished unless God does it, then guess what? God does it. And that's an awesome place to be. That's what Dr. Luke is recording for us here. What the risen Savior continued to do through his apostles by the Holy Spirit as he's fulfilling his prediction that they would take the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles and the world at large, right? And I am with you. Reminds us of the Old Testament prophets who had to stand in God's place and speak the word of the Lord knowing that their lives might be forfeit for it. And I'm afraid today, friends, those kind of prophets are few and far between. The organization of the church is a non-profit organization these days. Did you catch that? That, that? that was subtle. I'm sorry. Maybe I should work on that delivery a little better. Prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Okay. What does Jesus say? I have many in this city. Now, you might look at that and say there's many other believers already here, but I think what it's saying is I have many yet who will respond to the gospel if you'll just take it to them. What if we had that confidence today? What if we had that confidence right now that when we left there, knowing that we're on a mission that God sent us on 
to bring life to those who are lost, right, to take captive those who are POWs in the camp of, sa of Satan and bring them a life that they could not have without him, and we knew he was with us and we could not fail, would we go and share the gospel? You better say yes. I have many people who are out there, and there are many people God's yet drawing to himself, friends. We've got to take the gospel to them. He stayed here a year and six months. That's a long time. And what did he do there? The fourth thing, we wrap up with this. He taught them the word of God, right? He taught them the word of God. Paul taught the word of God like no one else. And by the way, he was still writing it, remember? He taught them about God in three person, blessed trinity. He taught them about the church as God's plan for the age. He taught them about how it should be organized and how it ministers with as many parts but one body. He taught them about God's plan the, for the ages and what was ahead. He taught them cons constantly, night and day. It was an ongoing everyday process. He taught them correctly. This was the one who taught about how important it is to rightly divide the word of truth, expounding God's word was something very important to him. He understood the danger of treating the Bible lightly all right, with a casual approach. And he taught them compassionately. Even to this church in Corinth, which was a wicked church that gave him a lot of fits, he still spoke with them in compassion as brothers and sisters in Christ. Can we learn from all that? See, friends, the fact that the gospel is not popular is all the more reason for us to share it. Because men and women cannot endure sound doctrine is all the more reason to teach it, brother. Keep doing it, yeah? It's not our responsible to make God's words acceptable. It is our responsibility to make it available. These are all part of Paul's pattern for disciple-making, preaching the gospel, baptizing believers, persisting through opposition and persecution, and teaching the Word of God. And you see in the last verses, we'll just summarize them very quickly, Paul is vindicated. The Jews come, they stir up trouble, they bring them before uh, the proconsul, and they say, Paul's stirring up trouble, and he's teaching something that's illegal. And the proconsul, the judge, sitting on the bema seat in a very public way with a crowd in front of him, said, I don't have anything to do with it. This is just a matter of your Jewish religion. He didn't even let Paul speak in his own defense. But what he did was very, very important, as we will see in the rest of the book of Acts. He basically legitimized the gospel. He legitimized Christianity. And therefore, it could be openly taught in the Roman Empire, and that would be continued to be looked at all the way up the Roman uh, judiciary. Interestingly enough, what did they do? We're not sure who they is, whether it's the Jewish people or whether it's the Greek people. We don't know, but we do know who got beat up. It wasn't Paul this time. It was Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. Does God have a way? <laughs> it's kind of a cynical thing, but does God have a way of uh, establishing what's right? Yeah. The story doesn't end there. You understand it continues. Paul continues his ministry, but we're going to end here. I want to ask this question. What can we learn from today's text? I think there are many things. Let me just give you a few. You probably have some of your own. When God, when God calls us to bring the gospel to people, he goes before us, and he walks beside us in the process, assuring that the results that he desires are accomplished. Do I need to repeat that? That was a lot. I think the greatest lesson we can learn here is to trust God implicitly no matter what, okay? Number two, the work of ministry is one best accompanied by a team of devoted Christ followers using their unique abilities to advance the gospel. Consider Priscilla and Aquila and Silas and Timothy and others. Every one of us has a role to play. So I ask, how are you playing your role? Are you on the field or are you in the grandstands? And then thirdly, are you persisting in your walk faithfully in our world? Have you begun to walk with Christ only to turn back at the very first obstacle you face? Or are you being faithful to your calling? Let me give you an illustration. Some of you might have heard of a, well, fairly decent preacher named John Wesley. 
Okay? Now listen to this. This is from his diary. Sunday, a.m., May 5th, preached in St. Anne's. Was asked not to come back anymore. I must be doing something wrong. They keep letting me back. Sunday, May 5th, p.m., preached at St. John's. The deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday, the next week, a.m., May 12th, preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. Sunday, the following, a.m., Monday, uh, May 19th, preached in, he just says, St. Somebody Else's. Deacons called special meeting and said I couldn't return. Sunday, May 19th, p.m., preached on the street, was kicked off the street. Sunday, May 26th, a.m., preached in a meadow, was chased out of a meadow as a bull was turned loose during the service. Sunday, a.m., June 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, was kicked off of the highway. Sunday, June 2nd, p.m., afternoon, preached in a pasture, and 10,000 people came to hear the word of God. Are you willing to persist in what you know to be right to do? Friends, every one of us needs to preach the gospel. Every one of us needs to be discipled. This life in Christ is something we must learn together. There's a process of going from infancy to maturity, and it requires your chosen involvement. Have you started that journey? Have you responded to the gospel in faith? Have you taken the next step of obedience in baptism? Are you learning and growing as you're studying God's word? And by the way, that takes a whole lot more than just showing up here on a Sunday morning once a week or once a month. If you don't know how to read and study the Bible, we'll help you with that. If you don't have one, we'll help you with that. Friends, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. I hope the Holy Spirit's speaking to you today. We have an awesome responsibility. Why? Because every man or woman or boy or girl who dies without Christ has a destiny that is determined. And the only thing standing between that destiny is you and the gospel. Now, I don't know every man and woman and boy and girl, and neither do you, but you know some, don't you? And there is no greater news in the world than to know that God loves us so very much that he sent his son to die for us. That anyone who might believe can be saved and have eternal life with him. Is that awesome? That's our job, friends. As always, when we conclude here, there'll be some friends up here be happy to pray with you, talk to you about anything we can do to help you. And let me remind you, as I always do, we're in this with God. And so I always remind you to go in what? Grace and peace. Grace, the confidence that God is at work in our behalf to help us become and do what we could never become or do on our own. And peace, why? Because there is no better thing you can ever possess than to know you have peace with God. And his peace passes all understanding. So my friends... Grace and peace. God bless you.